you're not going to want to miss this talk from Nicole. Nicole, I had the pleasure of mentoring her at another SANS summit previously, and uh, she's an excellent speaker. She's an Intel analyst at Group Sense. Um, and I love that she's going to dive into this word analysis because we've thrown it around all day. We've thrown around this idea of analysis and what does it mean? And so really excited to have Nicole share this concept that she created, the cognitive stairways of analysis. So Nicole, go ahead, please take it away. So again, my name is Nicole Hoffman. Um, some people might know me as Threat Hunter Girl. And a few months ago, uh, I started, uh, or yeah, a few months ago, I started my own blog and I wanted to write a blog post about analysis and what it really means and how to do it to give tips. And when I began researching, something kind of amazing happened. So I want to take you on a journey of how I unintentionally created my own analytic framework. So a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm currently an intelligence analyst at GroupSense. And uh, I have a bachelor's in information technology with a minor in cybersecurity. I have my security plus. Um, like I said before, I do currently own and maintain a blog. Um, and I am working on uh, getting a podcast available on my blog. So stay tuned for that. Uh, within the realm of technology, my passions lie in analysis, threat hunting, and risk management. And outside of work, I'm a mom of two uh, and a massive comic book fan and really just all things pop culture. Um, so going over the agenda, um, I'm going to start my presentation by discussing what is analysis and what, some, what are some of the challenges that I faced when I started my research that led me to dive deeper. And then I'm gonna go over six analytic models and discuss the key takeaways from each that I used to create my own framework. And currently there are three stairways in the cognitive stairways of analysis. And I'm going to be going over each one and then I'm going to um, discuss some helpful, helpful resources um, and some additional information to conclude. So we say this word all the time, analysis, but what does it really mean? You know, when I first started out in the InfoSec, this is something that I had to figure out for myself. And I kind of had an assumption, you know, you look at some data and you try to come up with some kind of conclusion. Well, that worked for me for a long time, but I'm more established now and I feel like I can ask deeper rooted questions to strengthen my own skill set. So when I was tasked or when I tasked myself really with writing a blog post, I thought it would be really easy. And I thought it would be, you know, grab a couple frameworks and add some key points and, and put it together. But what I found was everything was very vague. A lot of, um, the sources that I found were, um, you know, they just have analysis as a step, but they don't necessarily go into what it is and how to do it. So then I thought maybe because I'm just looking specifically in intelligence and analysis and cyber analysis, maybe I'm um, uh, like making my uh, results um, limited. And, and so I decided to expand my search to how are other or, uh, industries doing it? Um, and, and how could that help us in, in information security? So the first model that I found was in a white paper called a cognitive interpretation of data analysis. And it's by Garrett Grohlman and Hadley Wickham. The authors of this white paper compare the process of uh, sense making to the process of data analysis. And sense making is the process of how our brains make sense of the world around us. More specifically, the human mind creates and manages internal cognitive structures and that represent certain aspects of reality. And these structures or models are called schemas in sense making. And they contain a wide range of information about a specific topic or concept. 
So whenever our brain experiences a new event, it does one of three things. It Well, first, it tries to look for a relevant schema to match the event. If it doesn't find it, it either creates a new schema, it updates a schema, or it will just decide that that information is not um, trustworthy and throw it out. So to put this in, in easier terms to digest, imagine being a child experiencing a rainstorm for the first time. Your brain might not know what's going on, so it might collect a bunch of information about this event, create a schema and call it rainstorm. So the next time you experience a rainstorm, you'll know how to uh, make sense of it. But let's say this new rainstorm has thunder and lightning. So your brain might be confused at first, but then it'll realize the data still fits the schema. It just needs to be updated. So now your cognitive uh, schema will be updated to know, oh, OK, sometimes rainstorms have thunder and lightning. And I just thought this was really interesting how they put it all together. And, and I felt like it really defined what analysis is um, in the simplest terms. Um, and then the authors of uh, this white paper applied this model to the process of exploratory and confirmatory analysis. And exploratory analysis is one that begins with a data set with no preconceived assumptions or um, hypotheses about the data. Um, so for example, whenever my computer is lagging, I usually spend about 10 to 15 minutes trying to figure it out before I end up coming to the con conclusion that it's a Windows update. Um, confirmatory analysis, on the other hand, it begins with a hypothesis and then it seeks data to validate that hypothesis. Um, so for example, when other people's Windows devices are being really laggy and not working, they might immediately come to the conclusion that it's a Windows update. And they might immediately go and search their Windows updates to confirm that um, hypothesis. So my key takeaways from this um, analytic model was confirmatory and exploratory analysis. So the next model is from um, a book by Christopher Chatfield. Um, and it is titled Problem Solving, A Statistician's Guide. And it's a statistical investigation process. And this model is pretty straightforward, but when I first saw it, I was immediately drawn to step three, which is assess, or assess the structure and quality of the data or clean the data. Personally, I actually split this into two steps. So I split it into two key takeaways. The first key takeaway is the quality of information check. Um, or for this model, it's assessing the structure and quality. And what this means is um, when you're collecting data, you wanna make sure that the, you're checking the completeness of the data, and you also wanna make sure that you're confident with the sources. If you're not, then you might need to go and collect more data. Um, so this is where you might be able to identify gaps um, and, you're, and you're checking the confidence level. Cleaning the data, on the other hand, for me anyway, when I'm doing analysis is, is where data normalization comes into play and you're making sure that everything's in a common taxonomy and that um, you're emitting any useless data and getting rid of extra noise. Um, so those are my key takeaways from that step. The other step that I thought was really interesting was the select step. And I feel like this step is really where the analysis is happening. And I feel like it takes an exploratory approach to analysis because it starts with the data set and then they're exploring the data before creating a model or finding a model. And the author of this, uh, Christopher Chatfield mentions, the way that he finds the model is something called regression analysis. And that's my other key takeaway. It's not mentioned in the specific model, but it's mentioned in the text if you, if you go and read it. And what regression analysis is, it's when you have two or more data sets that you're looking at and you're trying to find a relationship between the data sets or um, 
or between the variables, or you're trying to look for an underlying structure. And I felt like that really expanded upon the idea of exploratory analysis. So if you think back to grade school, when we got a set of numbers, such as 246810, if you look at this data, you might immediately be able to come up with a hypothesis, oh, it's adding two each time. But let's say you have this data set, 28, 20, 13, 7, 2. You might need to explore your options before creating a hypothesis. So you might say, okay, well, 28 minus 8 is 20. Okay, maybe it's subtracting 8 each time. Well, no, because 20 minus 8 is not 13. So my data doesn't fit the model, so I need to create a new model. So then you might come to the conclusion, okay, maybe the number being subtracted each time is decreasing by one. And then you can check the fit of that model um, to, to validate that. And so I thought that was really important um, for expanding upon exploratory analysis. The next model I wanna talk about is actually one of the favorite models I found, and it is called the model of police operational intelligence analysis. And it's from a white paper called criminal intelligence analysis, or excuse me, uh, how analysts think. Think steps as a tool for structuring sense making in criminal intelligence analysis. And I don't want to butcher the names, but I did include them. Um, so this model is broken down into three steps, um, and I really enjoy. Excuse me, I really enjoyed that it took the step of analysis and broke it down even further. So this one begins with a briefing from an investigator, and then the criminal analyst would then establish think steps. Think steps provide a template that enables the analyst to approach the case, decompose it into separate elements, and classify uh, associated data accordingly. And then the criminal analyst could then request additional information, do some background research, and then before they do their analysis, they're doing that structure the data. Um, and when they're querying the data, they're schematizing it, trying to recreate the path before communicating the results. So in other words, the criminal analysts are attempting to choose a schema or multiple schemas to fit the data in the case to. And for criminal analysts, the uh, schemas are crimes such as murder, uh, human trafficking, robberies, burglary. Um, so each crime has its own set of think steps, just like an in information security, each piece of malware or cyber attack is going to have its own set of think steps. Um, and so I, I feel like it, this was so useful, so simple, but if you think about it, um, it could help us so much. Um, it could save us so much time. It could help with training. So think steps is honestly one of the best pieces of analytic advice that I've ever received. So the next model I want to discuss is from an article by Michael Coveney, and it's called Business Analytic Model Lifecycle. And there was no shortage of analytic models in business analytics and in, uh, in that field. But I really liked this one because of num uh, step six, which is monitor the, mon uh, the model performance. I felt like I immediately connected that to cybersecurity policies and monitoring their performance. And to better uh, describe that process, I just thought I would go into further detail so you'd understand. So if you look at step three and four, it's very similar to the process of step uh, sense making. The, they're trying to pick a model, and then if, if there's any discrepancies, they need to adapt the model. So let's say you're a policymaker and you believe in your cognitive structure based on your experiences that the only way to get malware is through a phishing email. And so you create your security policies based on those beliefs. Let's say one day you experience a malware event that is, that is caused by a malicious toolbar. You would then realize that it, the data still fits within your model, but you need to adapt the model. So you would not only update your cognitive schema, but you would also update your policies and procedures and security controls. And then you can use that model as, as planning for training and then monitor the effectiveness of that um, policy and the security controls. And so 
depending on your organization, an analyst isn't going to be the one uh, creating policy or monitoring the effectiveness. But I thought it was just an honorable mention, and I thought it's really useful for anyone that's creating and monitoring the effectiveness of cybersecurity policies. My key takeaway from this model was actually step one, which is define what is being investigated. There was a lot of models that had a similar step, but I think when it, this one used the word define, it made me think of threat hunting, because in threat hunting, you have to define a very specific goal or you might end up with too much information or not enough information. So it's, it's really important for you to determine the scope of the investigation. So that was my key takeaway from this model. So the next model is from a textbook called Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare. And I listed the many authors below and it's the medical diagnostic process model. And I'm sure this is just one of many uh, diagnostic models for, for medicine, but I wanted to include a medical model because I originally came from healthcare. So I had a lot of assumptions about what it might look like. And I was really um, interested. And so I, when I started uh, looking into it, it was actually kind of hard to find a specific analytic process. So I was really excited when I found this model. Um, and this model was the first one that actually took a cyclical process to the data collection and analysis phase. And this includes uh, collecting data from the patient, uh, translating that data into medical terminology, and then uh, creating a working diagnosis. Um, and one of the more exciting elements about this medical a diagnostic process is a physical examination. And the authors mentioned that a doctor can collect as much information from the patient, but a physical examination is really key because it's you get a plethora of information that you wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain. And InfoSec, if you think about it, is really no different. When you're an InfoSec, specifically if you're a managed service provider, you only get a small snapshot of a specific event or issue. And so you really have to establish those think steps so you know exactly what questions that you need to ask because you can't do a physical examination. And if you're on the other side and you are feeding information to a managed service provider for them to assist you with an investigation, it's important that you understand they can't do a physical examination. So try to give them the biggest picture that you can so they can provide you with the most help. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so my uh, key takeaway from this model was actually the communication of the diagnosis I thought that's how similar that is to intelligence analysis because we don't need to just explain our findings, we need to communicate them. And sometimes we have to communicate them to multiple people with varying levels of technical knowledge. And so it's, it's more than just explaining, but communicating. So this model is actually a workflow, but it's, um, a meteorology workflow and something that I don't really talk about too much. Um, I'm actually a massive meteorology fan. When I was younger, I actually wanted to be a meteorologist, but uh, then I found out that there is a bunch of math involved and I'm not that great at math. I'm actually horrible at math. Um, so that didn't end up happening. So when I started doing this research, I thought, well, I got to squeeze in something in the meteorology process because I just thought it would be really interesting. Um, so this uh, process is called the Simple Weather Forecasting Workflow, and it's actually from a white paper called The Optimization of a Heterogeneous Simulations Workflow. And I, again, don't want to butcher the names, but I did add them. Um, and this model, I thought, was interesting for multiple reasons, but the, the first step um, is geophysical environment or gr of ground, air, and water. And in science, specifically when you're doing any kind of experiments or data collection, you have to establish an environment. And I thought how interesting and um, similar that is to InfoSec, but something that we might um, not think about all the time and we just do it without thinking. But when we get you know, a specific security ticket that is about you know, Becky and HR, 
we're not going to go collect data from the CEO. You know, we're establishing this is where the event is happening. And so I thought that was really important for understanding the environment. Um, so that was my key takeaway. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about this model was the subjective interpretation by a meteorologist. And I felt like this was kind of like an additional layer of confirmatory analysis. And it's not something that I ended up using in my stairways, but I might add it in the future to another stairway, because just like in the last talk, um, she mentioned, you know, with editors, it's really important that you welcome that judgment and you welcome other people's opinions to confirm your findings. And this is more important if you're, you know, having a larger, more important investigation. So I thought that was really interesting with this one. So throughout my research, I learned so much and I, I found so many great models um, and I'm sure that there's plenty more that I didn't find that are just as useful or can provide a lot more key takeaways. Um, but when I started writing my blog post, I realized that I, I wasn't really getting a full picture. Like I wanted, to, my original goal was to define what is analysis and how do I do it? And so I thought, okay, well, let's take these, these key takeaways and list them and say, this is the things that I do and this is how I do them. Well, then I thought, well, if I'm going to list them, I might as well put them in order. So then as I'm putting them in order, I kind of put them in a stairway-like fashion. And then I realized, did I just unintentionally create my own uh, analysis framework? So of course, then I had to give it a name. So I named it the Cognitive Stairways of Analysis. And when I say stairway, I'm merely relating a step-by-step -step process to a stairway. There are some uh, optional cycles, but for the most part, it is a stairway with an end goal in mind, which is dissemination. And currently, as I said earlier, there are three cognitive stairways. Um, moving forward, I'm hoping to create additional stairways each one is based upon a certain starting point that you may experience in information security. Um, I'm imploring others to contribute to this framework, um, contribute other stairways or other starting points that I can research. Um, I'm hoping to do like some incident response specific, some OSINT specific and so on and so forth. And if you read, I have this entire um, presentation in my blog, but if you read it, I state in that blog that I was originally planning on putting all this information on GitHub so that people can easily contribute. However, I might end up switching that and just adding it to my blog. So apologies if you read that and I haven't yet put that on GitHub. So without further ado, um, let's get into the first cognitive stairway. So the first cognitive stairway of analysis begins with an alert. And this alert can come from a security tool. It can come by word of mouth, but essentially you're given a problem that you need to solve. Next, you need to determine the scope of your analysis. And remember, this, is, this includes identifying an end goal as well as establishing the environment. And step three, um, this is where you're going to compile the data and do that quality of information check. And remember the quality or QOI for short, sorry. Um, so the quality of information check is where you're gonna want to um, look at the, your data set. Um, are you conf confident with the findings? If you're doing specifically like OSINT, are, are you sure that that's a good website to, to trust data from? This is when that situation happens. So in the event you're not comfortable, you can go ahead and compile additional data. And once you're sure that you know the data is complete, you can move on to step four. Step four is where we're going to clean the data and omit useless data. And cleaning the data is, this is the step for data normalization, making sure that everything's in a common taxonomy. Um, this is really important if you're querying a large database. So for like example, if, if you're trying to look at all the retail stores for, you know, in the city of San Diego, if you have like 10 different versions of San Diego, if some people do SD, Sandy, 
and then some people spell it out. When you go to query, you might be only querying what you do. And so the data set will be incomplete. So putting it in a common taxonomy just makes it easier for you to make sure that there's no information gaps. And then omitting all the useless data, is, it's just extra noise. So it's not needed for the analysis. So it's better just to get rid of it. And specifically when you're querying like logs or like um, things like that, there's certain um, events that are like the system events or things like that. And so you might have to filter some of that out. So that this is the step for that. Um, once you are confident with your findings or with your data set, everything's been cleaned, you can move on to step five, which is exploratory data analysis or EDA. And this could be on, you know, you could review logs, you can review stuff in Excel, however you feel comfortable exploring the data, you could visualize the data, um, what, whatever makes you most comfortable, everyone's a little bit different. I personally love Excel, um, depending on the data set. This is also where you want to do your regression analysis. And if you remember, the regression analysis is where you are you have two or more variables, you're looking for that relationship or an underlying structure so that you can then generate your hypothesis, which is step six. Once you have a hypothesis or hypotheses, you can then establish your think steps. And remember, think steps provide a template that enables the analyst to approach the case, uh, decompose it into separate elements and classify uh, data accordingly. Once you have your think steps and your hypothesis or hypotheses, you can move on to step seven, which is confirmatory analysis, where you're going to uh, look, ensure that the data fits the model or hypothesis that you've created. If there is any discrepancies and you find that it doesn't validate your hypothesis, you can go back optionally to do some more exploratory analysis. Um, in the event that you don't need to, you can move straight on to dissemination, step eight. Dissemination can be in the form of written or oral communication. Um, I feel like it's a really important step for you to communicate your findings um, and ensure that your um, all of your work before this step was 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 worth it and that you can uh, explain it in the, in the best possible way. So the second cognitive stairway of analysis begins in one or two one of two ways. Um, this, this one, or no, sorry, this one has just one, one starting point. So this one, it begins with a brainstorming session. And so if you've ever been given a time, either just you've been thinking, oh, I wonder how, um, I wonder if we're uh, vulnerable to this, this is a time for that. Or if you've ever had your like CISO or someone ask like, hey, I saw this on the news. Do you think we're affected by this or could be impacted? This is the time for that. Anything that starts with a brainstorming where you're trying to consider like the likelihood of the event um, or specific exploit or attack, um, or if you're trying to determine like the vulnerabilities of a specific thing, this is kind of a great starting point for that. And so you would begin uh, with generating the hypothesis or hypotheses, and then you're going to generate those think steps right away. And then you can, once you have that, you can move on to determining the scope. And this is where you're going to ensure that you have your end goals, you also have your environment established, and then you can move on to step three, which is confirmatory or uh, key assumptions check. And the key assumptions check is a um, it's an analytic technique um, where you write down all of your assumptions about um, any given topic or your hypothesis in this in this uh, example, and you try to flush out um, any um, biases. You try to determine um, if there's anything that goes against those assumptions. Um, so this is a great way to flush out those biases. So then you, at the same time, you can do the devil's advocate. And devil's advocate is another um, analytic technique where you just basically um, try to look at something from, you try to think of any alternative to the assumptions or the topic at hand. So any alternatives, anything that might not work, you try to be that devil's advocate during that step. Once you've done that and you've flushed the, all of that out, you can move on to compile the data, do the quality of information check um, after you've 
you're comfortable with your data set, you can then clean the data, omit all the useless noise. And then because you've already generated your hypothesis, you don't need to do an exploratory data analysis or regression analysis. But sometimes I like to just double check it with exploratory or if I like to visualize it to make sure I didn't miss anything during my brainstorming session. So if you do find any discrepancies, if you decide to partake in this, you can just optionally cycle back if you need to update your hypotheses. And then you can just move back on to confirm your hypothesis um, before you move on to dissemination. So the third cognitive stairway, um, this is the one that actually begins one of two ways. So it can either start with a red team analysis or it could start by determining the scope of a red team analysis. And um, a red team analysis is where you attempt to put yourself in the attacker's shoes, um, which leads you to a certain hypothesis or hypotheses. Um, so if, if you're ever like, oh, hey, we have this server, I wonder how vulnerable it is, I, wonder, I want a list of all the vulnerabilities. Um, that's when it, you might have a specific scope set. But if you're ever scrolling through um, your, um, your network or your logs or anything and you think, I wonder if I could exploit that. That's when the red team analysis begins your investigation. It wasn't like you planned it, but you found it and you want to determine the likelihood. So you generate your hypothesis or hypotheses, you generate those think steps, and then you can move on to compile the data, check the quality of the data, clean it, get rid of the useless noise. And then just like in the second cognitive stairway, you can do some exploratory analysis if you need to, or you can just go ahead and confirm your hypothesis or your hypotheses. And then of course you can disseminate your results as needed. So th this one particularly I think is really helpful um, for those times where you're you're, you're already aware that you're doing analysis when you're doing it, but it kind of gives you a, like a structure to go by so you don't miss anything. Um, so I included a list, of, I know I went over a lot of topics, but I am going to share my slides afterwards and I wanted to provide some definitions for all the different ones and of course some helpful resources. So. I hope this presentation was useful for everyone. Um, I created it in hopes that I can help other analysts just starting out and to just take a deeper dive to strengthen my own skills. So hopefully um, I can create additional stairways in the future and hopefully it can be used as a framework for others to carry out their analysis.